All right. So hi, guys. I think the prep time has ended. Um, just to clarify. All right. Um, just to clarify, is OG here? Yes, OG is here. Okay. Um, is opening up here? Yep. Hi, opening up here. Yeah, CG here. Closing government, the battle of the trash heap. Yeah. Oh, yes, we're here. Thank you. Great. Sorry. And then closing opposition. Are you guys here? No, yeah, we're here. Okay, great. Um, so can my panelists introduce themselves, please? Hey, hi, I'm Ralph. Uh, no preference. Hi, uh, Ploopy here. Uh, no preference. Hi, Kanan. No preference. Hi, I'm Takua. I have no preferences. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Tota. Uh, he, him, please. Hi, I'm Aloysius. He, him as well. Okay, great. So hi, guys. I'm Carla. I uh, prefer gender pronouns and prefer that you acknowledge the panel as a whole. Um, congratulations for making it to the grand finals of this year's Japan BP. Um, debating on the motion about political parties develop in developing countries fighting for queer rights. I may now call on the Honorable Prime Minister, please. Here, here. Hello, am I audible? Yep, you're audible. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, before I start my speech, um, trigger warning. So I'll be mentioning um, suicide, persecution, and like other stuff like that. So um, just for everyone's like, I don't know, for your benefit. Um, okay. Um, also, before I start my speech, I'd like to thank my partner for debating this tournament with me and all the people that are watching, in case any of them are actually watching on YouTube. Um, so three... Two, one. Uh, obviously, we're going to run some kind of backlash argument, but the interesting twist we'll run is that this backlash makes things far worse for queer individuals by associating them with the radicalism and the new age thought of youth parties. This makes things far worse and makes them far more susceptible to violence and political persecution. Additionally, we'll also run an argument explaining why youth-based participation in success in general benefits all people because of their uh, advocation for free speech and other civil rights. Before that though, some responses. The first response I have is towards their point about how youths have more sympathy towards queer people. The problem is, is that they undercut this benefit by saying that young people are currently not eligible to vote. In addition to this, we think there are a variety of other barriers for young people in the present day. Firstly, they don't have jobs, which means that like they have less economic capacity to donate and help, help out the movement as a whole. Secondly, they have less of a capacity to speak out and be heard because they have far less social capital and are far less respected compared to other people. What they prove is that if we wait long enough, we will eventually succeed. Not that we will succeed now. This means that in the future, if we have a party run these things, then we might be likely to succeed. We think this is a really, really good thing for our side because it proves that youth parties don't need to do this now. We can rely later on liberal parties to catch the desires and interests of people on the ground insofar as it becomes a defining issue in the future. So they don't prove that there's an urgency. In fact, most of their arguments prove that the urgency is something that is decreased on their side. Second thing I want to respond to, they say that conservatives harming you is a marginal harm and that you get more media coverage, which is broadly a good thing. So they don't explain what kind of media coverage this looks like. We think this is likely to look like bad media coverage in the sense that they will spin you as radical, they will spin you as looking bad, obviously for the first reason that you challenge the status quo. And the second thing is that um, most media institutions associate themselves and benefit heavily from supporting the state and looking good with the state, they might be persecuted otherwise. So before I move into the rest of my substantives, I've cleared up the responses, there are two points of framing. Firstly, this refers to usually liberal youth-based party, political parties, just because these are the kind of parties where this motion would be feasible, not like the youth wing of the Republican Party, surely that would be like out of the pale. The second thing is um, this mostly looks like groups like Bayan Youth in the Philippines or the Revolutionary Youth Alliance of Brazil. Um, so these are developing countries. Uh, I'll just be using examples from there. So they can't run like all the material about how developed countries have gotten better because it's clearly different in developing countries. So first argument, we believe that youth-based political parties associating themselves with queer rights will cause queer individuals to become persecuted unjustly. We think this is bad for them in three ways. 
Firstly, we think currently youth-based political parties are persecuted. Firstly, because youth-based political parties run in direct opposition to entrenched dynasties in developing countries, both entrenched liberal parties and entrenched conservative parties. This means that they disproportionately receive challenges from the state and attacks from both sides of the political bench. Many youth leaders disappear under the night under the barest pretext of interrogation in more authoritarian developing countries, for example. Secondly, these youth parties propose generally radical things and attempt to shake up the status quo in an attempt to distance themselves from the centrism of the other two main parties that you'll likely see. This is why you often see them interact with movements and receive funding from groups such as Akbayan Youth and, the, and, and broader socialist movements in the Philippines or the Socialist Party of Malaysia, which is explicitly LGBT plus adv advocates for that kind of thing. The third thing is that youth groups in many of these countries also have a bad history because of the fact, uh, because generally youth, it was youth-based political parties post the colonial rule that were there to advocate for more radical things as well as the, were the first ones that take up arms and strike against the government. Fourth thing, lastly, youth groups are currently painted as incompetent, not, not having the legal know-how or the political know-how to be capable of passing their policies to the legislature or just making themselves be heard. What you do on your side is you irre irrevocably bind queer rights and queer individuals to radicalism and the mainstream stereotypical beliefs that people have towards youth parties. This is a really, really bad thing for two structural reasons. The first thing is that in countries with outright conflict, which notably is for many of these developing countries for three structural reasons. One is because of resource scarcity. That means that people have to fight for these things. The second thing is that developing countries are post-colonial states, which means that divide and conquer strategies meant, meant that there were various, various ethnic groups in these places that ended up trying to vie and fight for control over their own identity as well as uh, sovereignty. And the third thing is last thing is that um, globalization makes things really, really hard for them, which means that people are more likely to be radical and angry about, against the state in these places. So in most of these countries, so this is the majority of context, in countries like these with outright conflict like Myanmar or Hong Kong, you're likely to witness these people be hunted down by the state because they're associated with radicalism, because any one of these people could be supporting and fermenting re rebellion and terrorism against the state, could be threatening and challenging the legitimacy of the state. Secondly, on countries that are on the verge of these things, which are the rest of developing countries, we think this pushes it over for the reason that one, this often challenges the, uh, the the masculine norms that many people that many of the people in developing countries benefit from in power. These are often your machismo leaders that associate themselves with machismo and associate themselves with power. These are the people that are likely to be offended, by, have their sensibilities offended by this and have their feelings be challenged by this. In these situations, the, you, you experience the most salient harm, which is queer individuals who are innocent, who don't have anything to do with the conflict, are far more likely to experience violence and have their lives be far worse off. Secondly, you also split funding because in many of these countries there are existing queer parties that are not youth parties. So examples like Ladlad in the Philippines, Embrace Diversity Alliance in South Africa. You weaken the power of these queer parties because you force them to split votes between you, you force the youth to split votes between the youth party and this particular and pre-existing parties. Just because you're a youth party doesn't mean that you can articulate desires and obligations of queer individuals. We think that those that are pre-existing queer parties should uh, are normally better at doing this, even if youth parties might be okay. We think typically those rep those that represent their own identity should probably be better at these kinds of things. There are two problems then. The first is you split funding, which means that it's far harder for both parties to get their word out and differentiate themselves uh, and from other parties and get themselves to be heard, which means it's far harder for either side to get a win. And the second thing is you split votes, which means that um, not only in, in re representational districts where it's hard, far hard, far harder for you to get like, something like a veto or for you for you to be heard in legislative discussions, it's also far harder for you to get on the, to meet the requirements for things like participate in a national debate. This means that queer rights on, on, on Gulf side of the debate are massively backtracked and we think uh, obviously we win this issue on queer rights. Secondly, uh, briefly, I'll talk about youth-based parties. It looks like no one has POI, so I'll just move on. Um, firstly, we think that you encourage youth, uh, the goal of youth-based parties is to encourage youth participation in politics, involvement in local governance. The first thing is that we think this turns off a lot of conservative youths or youths whose families are conservatives and will prevent them from joining. We think this is a really, really bad thing because we also think that the interests of conservative individuals or uh, these conservative youths are also important since many of them will still care about things like climate change, since many of them will still support things like free speech and civil rights, but now we'll lose access on these things because they will see this as a black mark indelibly of an un unavoidably something that you have to avoid as a conservative individual. Aside from the fact that we think many of their inter interests align broadly with the youth and so you lose on a far, fairly large amount of the voter base, we think the second harm is that these people themselves also Feel like they want to be represented, but since they don't have an opportunity for them to be for them to be represented in youth based in, in liberal youth based political parties, they're far more likely to go to either conservative parties or pre existing conservative parties that are entrenched in the state already. We think this is problematic one because it backtracks progress for queer rights, but it also makes these people more radical and less willing to support the things that you support. The last thing is we also think that progress for queer rights can come in other ways, such as from civil and supreme courts. In legislature, there are several high barriers to pass, which is why in most developing countries, um, you you often had progress come from civil and supreme courts, which came from like having lawyers. And having people agree with you in the court. We think that there are structural limitations in protests and politics in developing countries. And often it is through gradual progress that doesn't get backtracked and doesn't get people persecuted and harmed is how you succeed in these places. So at the end of this speech, we do two very, 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 very basic things. The first thing we do is we benefit from OO bias and take the first. And the second thing we do is have a really great time in this tournament. Thank you, everyone.
All right, thank you for that speech. To extend the case for OG, DPM, please. Um, just a second, I'm going to start my timer. Can everybody hear me? Yep, you're audible. Okay, great. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. Honorable panel, queer rights are basic civil liberties and basic civil protections, such as restrictions on hate speech, restrictions on harassment, expansions of things such as freedom of expression and civil unions. The problem is, is that conservative politicians in developing countries with entrenched prejudices because of religion, because of practices, or because of traditions and cultures, believe that the youth who actively oppose and actively challenge the entrenchment of political dynasties are radicalizing queer rights. So what they do on the government side is that you associate queer rights with radical changes in civil policies, when all we're essentially asking for is protections against the discrimination, protections against harassment, which are basic civil liberties that are constantly being fought for in courts because liberals, progressives, and conservatives in developing countries agree that free speech, ability to not be harassed, is something that is quintessential in a developing country that wants to strive for progress and prosperity. The essential question, and more importantly, the three key reasons as to why we win an opening opposition is simple. One, we told you that coming from leader of opposition, no response from the deputy prime minister is that you exacerbate the persecution and oppression of queer individuals because you associate them with perceived radicalism or of the youth individuals. We think we gave you many examples, how a lot of people or a lot of conservative politicians who want to contain their power and consolidate their influence are red tagging youth as communists, as terrorists and everything else. Even if they're not, and we don't think youth political parties are terrorists or are radical, conservative politicians believe that they are. So they will always try to restrict and suppress the kind of free expression that exists. The problem is, is that now conservative politicians conflate queer rights and the queer agenda with the communist radical agenda of youth parties in the very first place. But secondly, we think that we told you that you diminish the influence of both youth-based political movements that are already losing massive amounts of political capital because they're challenging entrenched figures and also queer rights individuals that just need basic civil liberties. But lastly, I will argue in my extension how you destroy the perception of queer Queer rights as an exclusively generational issue when you associate it with youth based political parties. Before my issues or my extension, three key points of rebuttal. One, they argued that youth political parties are not always radical and they're probably the best representatives of qu queer individuals. We think that was a blatant misrepresentation and straw man coming from DPM. We think that the problem is, and we clarified this multiple times, is that governments and conservative politicians believe they are radical. That's why we see things such as the red tagging or the calling of communists of the Akbayan youth in the Philippines. How Malaysian and Brazilian governments claim that socialist youth parties are communist parties such as like che associated with Che Guevara and everything else. We think the spin here is that what happens is we do, if we don't associate this is that we allow for the expansion of civil liberties. If youth-based political organizations, liberal-based political organizations argue for many things such as restrictions on harassment, that is necessarily good in the very first place. So we think all those kinds of radical extremism and the most power powerful, the disruptive perceptions exist only on their side. Second point of argumentation. They said in a shared argument coming from opening government is that it's only the youth-based political parties that can represent queer individuals because they're educated, they're exposed to things like gender rights or gender theories and everything else. We think so what? The problem with the youth-based political parties and despite right, their education is that a lot of conservative politicians believe that they are elitist, believe that this is just a pseudoscience of the form of justification. They do not communicate in the language of conservatives. They do not communicate in the language of the LRD to understand why persecuting a homosexual individual is as bad as persecuting a, a straight individual in the very first place. But the comparative on our side is simple. We think that liberal parties are willing to associate themselves with not only basic civil protections, but also advancements in court cases. That's why India was able to strike down 337A and the anti-gay law marriage in the very first place, because they will show you how it's not only a political issue, but a human and civil issue in the very first place. Last point of rebuttal. They said that they attract media attention and young people will gain more popularity because that's, that, that's the trend for queer rights. One, we don't think that's necessarily true. And there's no response to leader of opposition's multiple analyses as to why you further 
discourage youth participation. We think what happens is that liberal children who live in conservative or religious families will either be afraid to associate themselves with liberal or youth politics or be restricted from associating themselves with liberal and youth politics because their parents don't want them to associate or affiliate themselves with homosexuals or queer individuals. So you restrict a lot of individuals who want to fight for politics in general. But fine, even if it is true that you gain more media attention, what is the quality of that media attention? We think you're more likely to be demonized by church TV or anything else, or the kind of fatwas in the mosque or conservative mosques send out in the very first place. So we don't think that media attention is viable or good in your place. But before I move on, yes, OG. That means that conservative politicians can easily conflate queer individuals with communist agenda, meaning that you legitimize their persecution, legitimize the suppression, and legitimize the arbitrary detainment of queer individuals because they're gay and because they're probably associated with communists. So if you accept that characterization, you accept that all those harms are more likely on your side. What then is my extension? Where then do we better guarantee the advancement of queer rights in developing countries? And this is a simple question. Will queer rights in our world be perceived as a civil, or political youth-based and generational issue. We think that the unresponded frame coming from government bench is that you, when you bind queer rights to radicalism, you deny things like general liberties, which generally benefit queer individuals, such as civil unions, free expression, and things like security and all those things. What then is the extension coming from this? We think that one, we think that entrenched dynasties or entrenched political systems will be less likely to grant general liberties of free speech for all individuals because they fear that it is a form of challenging their traditional masculine values or traditional cultural or religion of uh, religious values in the very first place. So what you do on your side is you distort queer rights as an exclusive benefit or as an exclusive privilege to queer individuals because we think that the youth-based political parties pander to the exclusivity of the youth interest in the very first place. But secondly, you incentivize incentivize conservative politicians to increase barriers to other forms of advancing queer rights, such as civil and Supreme Courts. Why is that likely? Because of things like corruption and being able to appoint Supreme Court justices or being able to appoint ombudsmen in the very first place. But what's the comparative on our side? If you don't conflate these rights or you don't conflate these interests with youth-based political influence, we think you're more likely to make people understand why general civil liberties are generally beneficial. But lastly, we think that you risk disassociation. We think that on the comparative, queer parties like Ladlad are already driving in the very first place. One, we think safety for these individuals is a prerequisite to any form of expression or any form of queer rights. But secondly, we think independent queer and liberal parties are more likely to succeed when especially when you don't associate them with radicalism because you see them as reasonable extensions of your civil liberties and overall progression in the very first place. In conclusion, queer individuals are more likely to be persecuted in your side. Youth political-based political parties are more likely to deny general freedoms on your side. But more importantly, the organic and natural change is guaranteed on ours. Thank you. All right, thank you for that speech. To open the case for the closing half, member of Gov, please. Can you hear me? Yep. Hello. The currents of change often favor the incumbent, meaning to say status quo will remain unless there's an introduction of new ideas. The arguments coming from op opening opposition is red, uh, of, of radicalism coming from their side is tautological and negative because what they essentially say is that because there's a kind of radicalism that exists, so you shouldn't introduce this particular manifesto and because of that, there's less change and because of that, people will continue to be radical. We think that we introduce you the pathways to success for youth political parties to not only shine, but to ensure that they have a, that they have a pathway forward in, all the, in success within political economy. The bar is on the floor as far as, uh, as civil rights go and we think we need to raise it as youth political parties. Parties. I'm going to introduce you three things. The first is I'm going to talk about why we need to capture you votes. Secondly, I'm going to talk about why, uh, why, why the political parties will pander. And lastly, I'm going to talk about paths to victory. But first and most importantly, I want to talk about why we need to capture you votes. Because OG kind of like glibly said, you know, like we should invest in potential votes. We're actually like discussing what the potential votes actually do and how exactly they become significant in this particular aspect. We say the reason they become significant is because voters currently and in long term can become swing votes. What do I mean by this? As people start to grow up and people are more entrenched into the 
uh, the particular westernized ideas, what often happens is that this particular interest compound on itself. Meaning to say, currently, you voters often only have choices to vote amongst conservative parties specifically, but they are not able to do so because they don't relate to the particular values that they stand for. Because all the parties are the same, they don't stand for the kinds of westernized ideas that we stand for. And in all those aspects, what this means is that they are they, they will start to become apathetic, especially in the introduction of their introduction of political participation when they are young. What this means is that they are, they, as you go along the time, what often happens is that you compound the number of people that currently exist, and these people become slowly and more clearly significant in this particular aspect. What did OO say? OO says, let the liberal parties do it. We don't really care whether the youth parties do it. But the problem with that argument is, again, that it is tautological. What do I mean by this? When you only let the liberal parties do this, and you don't let anyone else do this, what often happens is that the particular manifesto becomes more radical, meaning to say, that because there's a lack of showing of solidarity, there's a lack of showing of the kinds of trends that are moving towards the, 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 the embrace of this particular LGBTQ movement, what often happens is that you'll be isolated and you'll be decentralized in terms of the political power that you can assume. This means that it, it is their, their counterfactual is not just mutually exclusive, but they are, is harming for their side. In fact, decentralization of power will significantly reduce the power of these individuals to assert themselves, and we don't think that's a good thing. The second thing they talked about was this idea of how, and we specifically tell you there's a mechanism that helps them appear less radical, right? When more people appear ready, uh, in solidarity amongst the socialist party, amongst the liberal parties, amongst the youth parties, to ensure there's some form of compact that is introduced into this particular political economy that's otherwise absent on their side. So if they really want to talk about protections of civil liberties, they need to ensure that this mechanization of change happens. The reason you voters don't vote now is because they really feel apathetic, and we think that it is important to capture these youth votes in order to make them into bargaining chips as youth parties specifically. This will ensure that in the long run, youth parties will at least have some bargaining chip in order to show that they actually stand for something relevant instead and they're not similar to any other political parties out there. The second thing about why they will, uh, the political parties will pander. The first thing I want to note is that identity politics uh, means that you join, uh, it means your image is not only uh, new but also substantial, right? This means that it is not a, uh, this means that it is a given that there's a compounding chain in new generations, right? The youth will therefore now be empowered because now you see there's a substantial change and someone actually represents, some, many different parties actually representing that change specifically. We think that this is important because this changed the hearts and minds of the youth voters, especially now they can understand there's some level of change that can be produced, right? If you flip that, what the opposition suggests to you is that let the people actually uh, become targets in the first place. Don't normalize the idea that LGBTQ movements can be part of political movements or manifestos in the first place. All these things means that they have no mechanism for change under their side. And as youth parties, they also struck their struck their abdicate, abdicate their ability for them to therefore be responsible for their new voters specifically. We think that those things are bad. There's no path of victory, just another one of those insiders that are fighting for their own kind, for their own careers specifically. So we think all these things mean you don't differentiate yourself, you have less ability to change, you have less ability to control anything. What did OO tell you in, in the DLO? They said that, no, you can look at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is kind of a good idea. That argument kind of rests on this premise of a meme, which is just like you put the Supreme Court step one, step two, question mark, and step three, profit. We don't think that simply works in that way, and we think that there needs to be a mechanism mechanism for you to create a change that they haven't once actually explained. We think that it is important for us to mechanize that change and we tell you specifically yeah. that this is the route forward and they, they what they do is essentially they reduce the ability for anyone to compound on a change. We think that's far better, far worse. Oh, oh yes. Uh, OG says that the youth voters are reliable, educated and engaged. CG says the youth are apathetic. Who is wrong and why? So they, are, they, are, they can be both apathetic and educational. I, I don't see what's the con contentions here. Like, I think right now, if even if you're educated, you can say none, none of the political parties represent me. I don't want to vote. Uh, quite simple. So the third one is, more importantly, the feature of manifestos currently, right, mean that there will be increase of discussions within not just the parliament, but secondly, the internet. Why is this specifically important? Right now, as OO concedes to this, Traditional media is often dominated by the incumbent, by the people who are part of the uh, part of the like alliance of people who are conservative in general, right? In a world where public television has been dominated by space of traditional media, what this means necessarily is that the youth media or the youth political parties must capture social media. What do how do uh, social media gets captured? Social media gets captured in terms of hashtag activism, in terms of all these things that are currently unavailable to these people. Therefore, it creates an alternative channel for voice for people to voice out their concerns for discrimination for all 
all these like like hunting down their OOs apparently want to talk about to be featured specifically. Right now, you already see in, in places like Malaysia where they're talking about discrimination against Indians, where they're starting to speak out against these kind of issues specifically. We think that all this reduces the radicalism asserted by OO and that they refuse to acknowledge, right? Lastly, I want to talk about the path to victory because that's absent from any of the opening house specifically. The path to victory here is in the case of Taiwan. Because if you look at 30 years ago, when, when Taiwan was just a nascent democracy, what often happens is that people will laugh at you if they you say that they will support LGBTQ movement specifically. But because of student-led political parties and because of the discourse that's channeled by social media, what often this means is that they slowly but surely galvanize that kind of support. And nowadays, you see that this kind of LGBTQ movement is becoming a law specifically in the particular Taiwan. Without the introduction and with the fear of the, some level of backlash or fear of radicalism, you only compound on your own things. Side opening option can, must clearly lose because they uh, they are they fall trapped into their own problems. All right, thank you for that speech. To open the case for closing up, member of all, please. Uh, can everyone hear me if I talk like this? Yep. It's very, it's very, it's very, it's very nice. Thanks, David. Yeah, so uh, for POIs, just do whatever floats your boat, I guess. It's so, like if you want to have a placard, if you want to verbalize it, or if you want to write in text. Either way, I guess it's fine. Just don't be, don't, be, don't be very scary about it. Cool. Give me one second, I'll begin. Evan and I are going to be very ironic. In a debate about the youth, the extension from closing opposition is going to be on old people like low-wing fat. I'm going to do two things in extension. Number one, I'm going to do meta framing that takes out opening government and honestly the entirety of GovBench because I didn't really know what closing government was coming from. Second of all, I'm going to talk about old people and why we went on that ground. First and in terms of meta framing, there's three things to know in this debate. Number one, I think opening government loses in terms of role fulfillment because they chose to take a really soft case when they try to talk about examples like Netherlands that are kind of liberal. Because here's the thing. This debate, as opening up correctly identifies, probably exists within conservative context to the point in which if the youth is already very woke, they already care about things like queer rights, and that's already a prevalent point of discussion, then either it's already a voting issue or it's already very entrenched within the manifesto of a specific youth-led party. So to that end, I don't think that's where the debate takes place. I think opening opposition was right in pointing out that it probably takes place in relatively conservative areas. To that end, I think opening government's out of this debate. Number two, I think opening government's also out because a lot of their principal claims is hinge on the practical proving of why you generally speaking get better rights. Because to the point in which, as opening opposition correctly identifies, the treatment of individual minorities becomes significantly worse. I do not understand necessarily why you're necessarily going to get better principle ground to the point in which you get massive harm to these minorities. This is where we're gonna be different. I would posit as a unique extension from closing opposition that we're able to stand for broad policies that still allow for the benefit of individual minorities on the ground. Because here's the thing, I would say the average political party within developing countries likely want to advocate for things, for example, like anonymous applications and interviews and jobs, because it benefits, for example, women who has a significant voter base. It benefits, for example, racial minorities who have significant voter bases as well, or benefits the working class who have been discriminated against within that society. They likely also want to advocate for things like anti-discrimination laws and things of that nature. So to the point in which it is true that the general political scheme within those developing countries want to advocate for these rights, I would say that the broad benefits of these policies can still trickle down to individuals who are queer to the point in which anti-discrimination law or not anonymity within, for example, job applications generally still benefit those individuals. If we're able to prove this in extension, this does two things in the meta. Number one, it proves that opening governments probably out of this debate because we're able to claim some degree of that principle ground. But second and more importantly, just note that politics is always about compromise and not being like the most sexy principled person because you always have to compromise in order to achieve change. So to that end, I think opening government falls on principle. Third thing in terms of meta framing, I think there's a distinction between not explicitly saying we want to fight for queer rights in the manifesto and actively hating on queer individuals or not advancing those policies. As I proved in the previous meta framing, on our side of the house, we can still advance the rights of individuals who are queer. It is unclear to us as to why necessarily it becomes mutually exclusive. To the end, in which that's the case, I think the path to victory extension coming from closing government can just be easily co-opted on our side of the house because we likely want to do the exact same thing. But the thing to note here, and as a Taiwanese, I think I can speak for this. If in Taiwan 30 years ago, you said that we want to legalize LGBT marriage, I think there's going to be massive backlash against that. To the point which that is the case, the question then become, do these developing countries have the capacity to deal with such radical policies now? I don't think so. Given that then extension, why old people are important? I think the caveat of this extension is relatively simple. 
I think the first thing to know is if opening government characterization is that the youth right now is already very woke and educated and care. I think regardless of whether or not you're very explicit about standing for queer rights in the manifesto, on both sides of the house, that youth voter is likely going to vote for your party. And as a result of that, you're going to be able to consolidate some degree of critical mass and therefore actively lobby for change. To the end, in which that's the case, I think closing government, therefore, is pretty irrelevant in this debate as well, because these same youth swing voters are likely going to vote for the most liberal party, which is going to be the youth-led party on our side of the house and their side of the house as well. Given that then, the conclusion of my extension is simple. You lose out on the critical mass when you do not have the capacity to connect with old individuals and therefore it becomes significantly harder to make change. The reason as to why this on the meta beta opening opposition is because opening opposition is right about like more backlash, hate, discrimination. But note here, if the meta framing of this debate is that it exists in the most conservative of areas already, the type of hate crime and discrimination likely already exists on both sides of the house. So all is right that maybe exists marginally more, but I don't understand what the practical benefit or the tangible harm of that necessarily is going to be. I'm going to give you a more tangible extension. First question I'm going to answer, therefore, why do old people actually matter? Three reasons why. Number one, the context note within the vast majority of developing country, given the trend of globalization and the glamorization of the West, is that the most liberal of youths oftentimes go abroad and try to settle down. I learned this in my sociology class, but the vast majority of individuals, for example, in Southeast Asia, when they do go abroad, try to get permanent residency in places like Canada and the US, because first of all, the perception is that they're more liberal there. And second of all, they just generally think that the economic prospects are going to be more lucrative there. To the end of which that is the case, the reason as to why this is important is because insofar as the most liberal of individuals are going to not be engaged within domestic policies, you need to cater towards another group of individuals or you're never going to be able to garner critical mass. But second of all, even if all the really woke liberal youth stay, the problem is that the youth have limited political capital. I'm sure a lot of judges can resonate with this, but like once you get out of college, there's like student debt, you need to pay back your family, like your job's probably going to be pretty sucky for like the first five years. But even if you have like a really amazing job, just on net, the amount of time you've been working is comparatively less than like oldies. And as a result of that, the amount of money you have on net is just comparatively going to be less. The reason as to why this is important is because when you have oldies that you're able to work with and you don't alienate the oldies, that's when you're able to co-op a lot of the benefits and infrastructure that you uniquely have. But the third thing to know about why old individual matters is because the context of developing country politics is one in which there's a hegemonic consolidation of power within political dynasties. That's to say, as a result of the post-colonial structure and the relatively frail nature of developing countries, and the democratic systems within these developing countries, that's the same moment in which oftentimes you only have two dominant parties and people only vote for those two dominant parties because of party loyalty. The reason as to why this is important is because cross apply what I told you about the youth having limited political capital. That means that it's very hard to penetrate and break into the political discussion in the first place as an average youth led party because you don't have a lot of money and everyone else is like, is like already very accomplished. Why are we able to make change on our side of the house? No, thank you. The first reason is because when you're perceived as less radical per everything opening op said, but this is a different conclusion. When you're perceived as less radical, that's the same moment in which old individuals likely want to work with you. The reason as to why this is the case is because there's sufficient incentive for them to engage with you on a political level, because first of all, the liberalizing trend within politics means that they have an incentive to capture minority votes. But second of all, even though the youth is not a substantial minor majority, which is why independent on their own, they can't make a lot of change, there's sufficient swing, swing voter group as closing government correctly identifies. So to that end, there's an incentive to substantially capture them because it allows you to necessarily win in politics. What then is the conclusion of this? Number one, on our side of the house, you're able to be more established because maybe you can't have 100% of your policies, but you're able to work with individuals who are old. These oldies will inadvertently allow you to indirectly be represented through parliament, which is the most easy way to make change. But second of all, you're able to co-op the funding that these oldie political parties have. And as a result of that, you can directly speak up on the ground of parliament. The distinction between that and the representation opening government gets is that the media will portray you in a certain way. On our side of the house, you can directly use the infrastructure of the existing party so you can speak out on the televised stage and talk about your issues. You don't get that on the comparative. The reason as to why this is the most important thing is because even if we're ideologically impure, if you do not have the capacity to be in positions of power in politics, you can never make change. We indirectly get representation, which is the path to victory that closing government tried to but could not get. Very happy to oppose. All right, thank you for that speech. To summarize the case for Gov, Gov, please. Uh, am I audible? Yep. Okay, thank you.
I think an important thing in this debate is to recognize that as we're speaking as of now, there are a lot of queer individuals, even though they are just carrying out their daily lives in private capacities, they are still demonized by the media by saying that this is the demoral decay of the society. A lot of political parties still use these lines to pander and support, uh, to pander towards the conservative parties, even though they are not doing anything radical or appearing on international media. I think the biggest failure of the opposition bench is to provide us with a counterfactual where they are actually safe, even if they choose to stay silent. We think that the harms are all more symmetric and I will prove in later half of my speech why they're likely to be worse off if you stay silent in the long run. They are just, I'm just going to do a team by team comparison. Firstly, I'm going to explain why uh, closing government beats opening government. Then I'll move on to the comparison with OO and by lastly, CO. Uh, CO is largely derivative of opening opposition in which they push the harms. So I'm just going to do them at least once. So one, why do we closing government beats opening government? Recognize that a lot of the characterization coming up from opening government is successful only in explaining why there's a rise of youth votes, but they lack the persuasive power and the mechanism to explain why these youth votes will count and eventually lead to them winning the elections or at least serving as swing votes like what Yao Kun characterized, such that they will at least push some queer policies in times of a political deadlock. I'm going to explain that in depth and flag out what exactly Yao Kun pushed in terms of two phase as well why we beat opening government uniquely. One, there's a lack of response from opening government with regards to the de-radicalize de the image of queer individual communities or youth parties in general in the media. There's a very simple logic, I think it's the strongest logic that was still unresponded by the entire gov bench uh, coming out from Yao Kun. It is easier to paint a party as radical if they don't speak up for themselves because the party that is then representing what a queer community or what a youth party then looks like without a counter narrative by the youth party themselves is that the conservative can always spin and demonize them to the most extreme form possible. Yao Kun explains why, the, given the counter narrative and given the support of Western media and also international community, you're more likely, far likely going to claim the correct version of how you present yourself, not as radicals, but really as someone just pushing for the basic human rights in order for you to carry out daily lives in safety, addressing all the problems that are coming up from opposition bench, but not resolved. Secondly, I'm going to explain why uniquely, even if you concede that there will be in the long run or, or like in a far foreseeable future, it is unlikely that the youth party or that uh, any queer um, um, political parties are likely to win the elections. Why are their votes still significant to the point that they will be able to push for queer policies or at least protection of queer rights? Understand that politics works often in times there are dominant parties who are in rival. It means that, it means that if in a case of a very tight political deadlock, that's when political parties start to search for swing votes. Otherwise, uh, voters who didn't turn up in the previous elections, they are likely to vote for the party that are able to promise then immediate policy changes. This is where, or this is the case of like Taiwan where you see like legalization of gay marriage for instance, where even if dominant parties are running other economic policies or other health policies, they are along the lines of conservative lines, but they are willing to then do the concession, negotiation and trade off their CEO sort of like throughout the outcome, but really never explain why that will be the case. That's when the swing votes of you voters who are a new batch of people who doesn't have their own established uh, parties to become the part of the uh, dead political deadlock, they are then able to then trade their weight, uh, votes off in exchange for tangible policy. At least on our sides, we get tangible policies and protection in terms of the protection of the queer community in general. We think that's fairly clear and that's a very reasonable burden that we place on ourselves. We didn't push the hard burden that OG tried to prove in terms of like winning the elections. We think that we explain even if the numbers are not big enough to win the elections, they're significant enough to break political deadlocks, we are able to trade them off. But lastly, I'm going to, uh, uh, okay, I'm going to deal with now or uh, comparison from between closing government and opening opposition. I'm going to explain why all the harms are symmetric and I'm going to flip all the harms onto opening opposition. One, the first time that they say is there will be more attacks on core individuals because they were seen as radical. I think firstly, in terms of the media, I already addressed that in the first half of my speech. But secondly, I'm going to explain why it is likely to be worse off. Because when there are no attention, it means that it's harder for community to reach out to the victims that suffered the kind of violent attack. It means that you're not able to raise immediate fundings to help the families to recover from the attacks that are still existent on both sides. We don't think that just because you start showing yourself more and pandering towards like youth uh, political parties, you'll get more attacks. But there will be definitely significantly less help if you do not if you appear as invisible communities and your tra tragic uh, experiences just went under the radar. And it's far worse off because the real money and their real changes are coming out from the international community. If you're unable to push for the media to the such extent that the international community is able to achieve a large amount of funding or at least bring these individuals overseas for them to flee the prosecution, it's very hard for for them to gain any form of remedy in that case. Before I engage with the remaining uh, two uh, harms, uh, I would like to take OO. 
So none of this overtakes the material we already brought out, which is that you divert money, votes, and resources away from pre-existing queer parties that can be trusted to represent the queer okay, more. Yes, the diverse vote is the third point I'm going to address. I'm going to secondly address why youth political parties, uh, if they challenge the incumbent party, they will be likely to be seen as more radical. I'm going to deal with that uniquely. Okay, recognize that it is the same because the, if not, if they are youth political parties and they are not part of the dominant parties, it means that they are running something that cannot be captured by the dominant party. That's why they don't just join the dominant political party. As long as they are running something different, the whole prosecution of them throwing them in the jail, uh, treating them as political prisons, exists on both worlds. They are not significantly better. In fact, they have less funding from international community, quote whatever I said, uh, for the queer communities. Now, lastly, I'm going to address the point about split votes for queer parties, which is a part of the POI in response to OO. Uh, so, recognize that um, this is more true in opposition because recognize that if you parties are not going to pander for queer rights, they are going to pander for something else, something that's different from what queer political parties are going to run for. That's when the split of votes happens anyways because they're going to run for something else. But it is far worse because there's a high likely chance that the queer po political parties that have not been doing well in the previous elections are willing to take a bet and they will want to place their votes and consolidate their voting abilities as a block with the current youth political party. They are more likely going to collaborate as a block. We resolve that. Lastly, I'm going to explain why we beat CO. CO's only unique contribution is this idea that, um, okay, uh, old people matter because uh, a lot of woke youths now live for more liberal countries. I think short, uh, I think our first argument is not, uh, the point about swing vote is not necessarily vulnerable to this because even if they are not significant in large numbers to win the elections, they are still significant to break political deadlocks. We don't think that the we need a large amount of woke use to stay in uh, within a country, but we think we have a better change in the long run because right now we are able to at least give the woke use a hope that the country is has a possibility to change for the better so that they, it will slow down the process of them fleeing to more liberal countries. It's fine to be worse off, but you don't see the hope of any change. Therefore, we are very proud to propose because we beat every single team in all the comparison I've said that we flip all the hums of bench. We have heard how to propose. All right, thank you for that speech. To finally end this debate, up with please. Um, hi, can you hear me clearly? Yep. Okay, great. Politics is ultimately a game of strategy. And this is a strategy in which the opposing bench, the side of government, will always lose if you as a youth-based youth party further a queer, a queer manifesto in the very first place. So a manifesto that includes having queer activism and queer rights in the very first place. We think that we've, we're gonna deal with the bulk of material that came out from both the government benches, we're going to tell you why we're explicitly different. You can't just assume or take the what the government would told you by just assuming a blanket of being derivative and then just moving on because that's disingenuous to the case that we brought to you from the member of opposition. But before that, we'll move to a few levels of rebuttals to the side of closing government. So we think largely what the closing government has brought to you is to say that they want to further the change by being a swing voter bloc or by being individuals that contribute to some sort of critical mass that you can amass some sort of leniency or some sort of power within parliament, for example, or within the political sphere, and then be able to further the change that you wanted to do in the first place. The reason why this is impossible to exist and can only happen on the side of closing opposition, because notice how in a lot of these conservative countries, there are a lot of cultural and religious importance placed within politics because of how individuals view those kinds of things as important in their lives. So now if it comes for powerful coalitions to want to absorb your youth party or offer you ministerial positions, it comes at a trade-off that if I support you because you support queer rights, something that is diametrically opposed to what actually happens or what is supported within the country, this means me losing current voters that establish conservative individuals that already voted for me. That is the calculus that will exist in the world of gov specifically when you introduce something that is as radical as that has been characterized already throughout the debate that is why that is not a swing voter group that can exist in the very first place but then we'll move on to the issues in the debate and clearing up why clearly closing opposition one. We think the reason why we win over slide of opening opposition was because a lot of the examples are extremely um, 
although true or in reality in a lot of countries, we think unrepresentative of the actual nuance of what happens within these countries. We don't think it's true that you're just instantly labeled as communist, you're jailed and then you're murdered on the streets, for example, we think will provide you what the actual reality and the context is for a lot of these individuals in these developing countries. But it will also tell you, and we were the in the bench side and the up bench side, we told you a roadmap to potential change. We think what side of opening opposition failed to do was tell you the converse or how things get better. Because all they've told you is that it becomes worse or people are demonized or you're further prosecuted. But we think what they lacked or what they didn't extend further is how then we want to prioritize the individuals in the future, how queer individuals get some sort of rights or the ability to live basic good lives in the very first place. I'll take one later. So on these three issues that I'm going to discuss in this debate, that happened in the debate, number one, pertaining to the queer individuals on the ground, what happens to them. Secondly, on how the political landscape looks like, and this is uniquely what came out from the sort of closing opposition, how you get more political cooperation for the furtherance of certain policies that can trickle down to the individuals that we want to protect in the debate. And thirdly, on the future of queer rights and the sustainability of furthering these sorts of things in the first place. One thing to recognize is the characterization of why queer rights or introducing this in its manifesto is something that will largely be a big political landmark within these de developing countries. Notice that a lot of these countries have strong cultural and religious ties because often it's associated because um, they weren't in the Western liberal world. There's less exposed, there has been less exposure to education from the get-go. And also the, these were individuals and this extends on the characterization of OO were put in like post like in colonial positions when they were colonized, when they were divided and conquered. This put them in positions where they had to rely on some sort of omnipotence for senses of solace and hope, things that a lot of Western countries didn't need to have because they were the colonizers. They were able to pertain to, to live certain basic qualities of life that they didn't have to experience. This is why there's very strong religious and cultural ties, which is why the thing that, which is why what OG furthers by being extremely explicit in the fight for queer rights is something that can never exist or something that will always be shut down because individuals on the ground are diametrically opposed. To it before I'm one OG. Even in the best case that you assume they are educated, we've told you a multitude of reasons why it's hard for you to get elected because of the conservatism and because of the negative connotations that come with being um, with being representative of queer, unfortunately, within these countries in the first place. But now we'll go on to the three key issues on how we help the queer individuals on the ground. We think what Gov tells you if you have some sort of representation and a principle of duty and obligation to do this to them. We've told you from the member of opposition why this is null in the debate, because as much as it's true you want to represent these individuals, it means absolutely nothing if you don't further political change. We've already proven to you why political change is impossible to further, because the conservative connotation that you have makes it impossible for you to become like powerful or pander to the old establishments of politics that exist within these countries or within these developing countries in the first place. But even if in all instances that none of this conservatism exists, we think this is why we uniquely on side of closing opposition can take the debate from here. We think we have to then prioritize the average voter and how these individuals in a developing country prioritizes the political parties they affiliate with and want to vote for. In a developing country where the econ economy is developing, where individuals are probably jobless, when poverty is probably on the rise, the things individuals prioritize is not going to be equality for all, it's not going to be the solvency of queer rights, it's not going to be things that are abstract to them, such as gay marriage, even if it's important to those certain communities, they are going to prioritize things like economical development, economic stimulus plans. The reason why it's a political landmine one, aside from just being conservatism and the connotations that come with it, is individuals don't see you as trustworthy in furthering and in developing the country, in allowing individuals on the ground to get a better sustainable quality of life, because you prioritize things such as these, this um, 21st century idea of liberalism and I liberalism in the first place. We think that is why uniquely, especially from side of closing opposition, we're extremely charitable and engaging with all the contacts that exist. The reason why you can't put credit these kinds of things to side of opening opposition was because we, we think they took a very large and uh, large and like a very extreme and scale to say that you're going to go to the extent in which you're viewed as communist. You're going to be constant demonization will happen to you. We think on our side, the trickle down policies that can exist, such as no workplace discrimination can also exist for these individuals and can only happen the point which are able to some degree to pander to all political establishments because the ideas that you further are diametrically opposed to established entrenched views of religious, 
religion and cultural and culture and culture that plays importance in things like marriage. I think when you're able to do that and get some sort of power and leeway, that is when you help individuals on the ground. Proud to open. All right, thank you so much, guys, for that debate. You may virtually cross the house. Um, I think for the judges, we'll be, we're gonna be like moved to a breakout room for the deliberations.